The book of Genesis. I am so excited about the book of Genesis. We are going to look at this book different from any commentaries that you have read that have been written in the last 200 years. This story that's in the book of Genesis was so closely held, especially the creation story, so closely held that just seven generations of seven men in the line held that story and told that story in order for it to be written down. Actually, it was six generations that passed it to Moses, who's number seven. So let me, let me show you something. In the book of Genesis, in chapters 5 and chapters 10, we learn that Adam was created and he lived for 930 years. Now that's lunar years, folks. Remember, they didn't have a Seiko watch. They didn't know minutes and hours, really. They knew when the month changed. On a lunar month, how do we know when the month changed? What is it? Uh, duh, it's a new moon. Yeah, it is. So that was their time clock. When a new moon came up, they knew that they, the next month was going to be 29 days. Next time a new moon come up, it's going to be 30 days. Next time a new moon came up, it's going to be 29. Next time a new moon came up, it's going to be 30. That's the way the, the, the lunar calendar is. It's 354 days. Had they been using the solar calendar that we used, he would, if we recalculate his 930 years, he lived 901 years in our time, in the way we do a calendar, okay? But just put that out of the way, okay? Put that out of the way. Just remember, the time was actually a little shorter by the way we count than it was the way they count. So years were clicking along 11 days faster every year than just um, than the way than the way ours is. Okay, so the book of Genesis reveals that, and this is in Genesis chapter 5 and chapter 10, uh, where all this data is coming from. When Adam died, one of his grand, great-great-grandsons is named Methuselah, and Methuselah is 242 years old whenever Adam dies. They're living in the same neighborhood. I believe they probably knew each other. You follow me? Okay. So a man who's 242 years old probably has heard the story of Adam from Adam's mouth being and the first of creation. You follow that? They're living in the same neighborhood, same part of the world. He's a great, I'll show you that in just a minute, okay? I'll show you that in a minute. All right. The, the record in Genesis also tells us that from Adam until the flood with Noah, Methuselah dies the year of the flood, before the flood happens. What does that mean? That means that two men carry the creation story to the flood, to the flood. Now, turn to your second page and the chart's there. You see that, the chart, you see the red lines? Some of you need a magnifying glass, I know that. I do too. Put your glasses on. I, the red lines are the lines that I have drawn up here on the board. Look at the people in between. Adam has a son by the name of Seth, who has a son by the name of Kenan, who has a son by the, by the name of Mahalei, who has a son by the name of Jared, son by the name of Enosh, son by, by, by the name of Enoch, then comes Methuselah, Enoch's son, then Lamech, then Noah, then Shem. That's just for example. I could have picked a whole bunch of people in here, but the shortest way, the shortest way to the flood is from Adam, who... Uh, through Methuselah, who was 242 years. But we've got other witnesses here also. You see that? Methuselah's <clears throat> not the only one who knows about the flood. I mean the creation. Because there's other ones that are there. And look, look how long Seth lives. Well, Seth lives way into Methuselah's life too. Way on down. Seth's still alive after Adam dies. And so is Kenan, and so is Mahalaya. In fact, Enosh down there, who also knew Adam, lives way into the life of Methuselah. You see this? We've got many witnesses who know Adam. 
that go all the way down to the to within just a few years of flood, and Methuselah takes the flood. I could have used Noah because he's a big wig in the book of in the book of Genesis. I could have used Noah, but I wanted to go a little quicker to my point. So Noah has three sons, and one of his sons is, according to that list, is the is Seth. Seth is 100 years old when the flood occurs. Seth is 100 years old when Methuselah dies. They're living in the same neighborhood. You're going to try to tell me that Seth hasn't heard the story of Adam from uh, Shem? Hasn't told? Yeah, y'all keep me straight here. I've been up a long time. Shem hasn't heard the story of Adam from Methuselah who knew him personally. Now, look back at this. Okay, Shem is alive. Lamech's alive, who also, Lamech also knew Adam. Shem's grandfather, Lamech, Noah's dad. Shem's grandfather also knew Adam. Uh, Noah is going to be born shortly after Adam's death. But Noah knows Methuselah also. See all these witnesses? These are relatives. These are the son of a 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 son down in generations. So we're going to pick Shem. Shem is 100 years old when the flood occurs and Methuselah dies. Okay, let's skip on down. You're going to see here there's other names. There's names like Shelah and Ebner and Peleg and Ru and Sugar and Naor and Terah and Abraham. Abraham is a big, big deal in the book of Genesis too. But I don't want to do Abraham, I want to do Isaac. Why? Because I'm trying to get the shortest way to, the, to, to hold it together. Isaac, Shem dies when Isaac is 60 years old. I think Isaac's a man too at this point in time, a grown man. You, you follow me? I'm talking about people who are grown adults. Isaac heard the story about Shem and probably from Shem who heard from Methuselah and others who heard from Adam and others. This isn't qu quite closely held together. Then Isaac dies when Joseph is 30 years old. Joseph goes into bondage and in, sold into Egypt's slavery and put in jail when he is 17 years old. 17's a young man, but old enough to remember Isaac. Old enough to remember the stories that Isaac has told him. And whenever Joseph dies, Joseph is only about 79 miles from Isaac. Joseph is in Egypt. Isaac is still over in, in the, the Hebron area. They're about 79 miles apart. Here's what I'm saying to you. Let's say Isaac has, is, is dying here in this room with us today. And Joseph is in jail at the statue in Huntsville. That's how close they are. They're not far. And yet Isaac, because he's been thrown in jail, does and Jacob do not know where Joseph is. But that doesn't matter. Joseph was 17 years old and he was already a hot shot being led by God. I shouldn't use the word hot shot, but you know what I mean. He's a big deal. He is a real big deal because the Lord is already telling him in dreams things. things. The thing that got him in trouble here is, is he had already been told by the Lord the dream about his brothers bowing down to him. And he didn't keep it to himself. He went and told his brothers. And they schemed against him and threw him in a pit and sold him to his cousins. The Edomites. No, the Ishmaelites. I'm sorry. They're all going to marry in together anyway. All right. So th he's, Isaac dies when he's 30. Now, Joseph is really not where we want to go with this story to get on down to Moses. Joseph has a brother. In fact, if you want to turn about it, you're going to read about it, but I'm going to tell you about it. It's all here. <clears throat> Isaac, when Jacob, I'm sorry, Isaac's son Jacob is running because he's stolen the birthright. He is 70 years old and he has stolen the birthright from his brother Esau. He's headed off and he's gone up into Mesopotamia and there he's sitting at a well and a sweet little lady shows up that is more than less than half his age. He's 70. She's 20, 25, 
17. We don't know. And her name is Rachel. And in that culture, Jacob does the most unforgivable thing. Do you know what he does? Do you remember? He kisses her without asking and working a deal with her father right off the bat. And he is smitten. He is in love. He'll work for her. Love is blind. Y'all know that. Yeah. Guys, some of y'all are married to women. I don't know how you're staying with them. But you love them to death. Women, some of y'all are married to guys that I really don't know how you're staying with them. But you don't see their faults until they really make you mad and you see it for a half a minute. And then all of a sudden you love them again. I keep telling this to my daughter and to other people. Love is surely blind. It really, truly is. And and, and it's, it's, it's supposed to be that way. And I remember I've heard, I don't see, I don't see what he sees in that girl. Cause blah, 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 and I go, she loves him. I mean, he loves her. He doesn't see all that stuff. Why, well, she can do better than him. She loves him. It doesn't matter. And some of us guys are pretty sorry also, you know, but we got wives that love us. I keep looking at myself in the mirror thinking, boy, am I lucky. I'm the luckiest man in the world. Rachel loved Jacob, and Jacob loved Rachel. He would work for seven years. So he worked to deal with the dad to marry Rachel after working for him for seven years. And on the wedding night, dad decides that it's not right for the youngest daughter to be married before the oldest daughter. So he slips Leah in there, the older sister. And the next morning, when Jake, when the light comes up, Jacob realized, uh-oh, somebody has deceived me. By the way, the name Jacob means deceiver. He had been deceived by one better than him. So he makes a deal with the father to work another seven years for Rachel. And during this time, Leah is barren, has no children. So finally, after 14 years of working, Jacob marries Rachel And there's jealousy going on in Leah's heart. And the Lord opens Leah's womb and she begins to bear children. And by the way, she's also got two handmaids that she's given to bear children. And by the way, Rachel can't bear children yet, right off the bat. And so she's got two handmaids to bear children. And so they're giving all these handmaids to Jacob. And so he's having, you're going to have 12 boys and one girl with six women. Women, I cannot explain that. That is one of those things that when we all get to heaven, we're going to ask, why in the world did you allow this to happen? Actually, we're not going to ask that because God's bigger than that and we will know it and understand, but I don't understand that. Okay, I just don't understand it. I don't think it's right. Because if, if it re- really is Adam and Eve, one man and one woman, why did God allow that to happen? And, and, and I actually can't explain that. And we'll take that when we get to it. So what happens is within three years, after, when, when Jacob is 84, 85 years of age, he begins have, Leah begins having children, which means he's going to be at least 87 when the third child is born to Leah, which is Levi. Now, all these boys, except for Benjamin, all these boys are, are born, and, and girls, all these 12 kids with six women, are born within a three to five year time span. They are close in age except for Benjamin. And, of course, Rachel's going to die when she gives birth to Benjamin in the city of Ramah. All these boys, including Joseph, are, are, are born up in the Mesopotamia area, Haran. Um, it's Syria today. We'd call it Syria today. They're going to come down, and Levi, his, Joseph's brother, is going to come to Egypt to be protected by Joseph with all of his other brothers and with his father and the family. It's going to be 70 of them come. Levi's going to have a son by the name of Korath. Korath's going to have a son by the name of Amram. 
Amram is going to have a son by the name of Aaron, a daughter Miriam, and a son by the name of Moses. So, to get to Ad, from Adam, we go Adam, Methuselah, Shem, Isaac, Joseph, really Levi, Korath, um, uh, Amram, Moses. Six men tell the story down to Moses. You caught up with me? This is pretty tightly held. This is not hundreds of thousands of years of stories being told through hundreds and hundreds of people. We can trace this down to six people who gave the story to Moses. But now listen to me. Page three. All of that does not matter a hill of beans. It matters nothing. Because this story was not written down based on tradition. This story was written down by the guidance of the Lord himself. Page three. The Lord's protection of all the scripture did not lie in the hands of mere men. The apostle, I've got the word Peter there, that is a misprint. It's Paul, I'm sorry. I, I typed it so fast nobody caught it on our editors. The apostle Paul says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And it goes on. Now, today, we have a definition from Merriam-Webster that tells us, which is what was still, which was what was in place whenever I was in seminary a ton of years ago. Okay, I was in seminary 78 to 83. How long ago was that? 78 to 83. How many, how? A ton of years. That's good. Okay. For those of us who are math geniuses, all right? Uh, 34, thank you, sir. The definition, something that makes someone want to do something or that gives someone an idea about what to do or what to create or a force or influence that inspires somebody. So you're out there with your chainsaw that you did not make, that you bought from Home Depot. And you cut down a giant tree. And your next door neighbor says, hey, you're pretty good with that chainsaw. You ought to carve out a doe for Christmas time, a uh, reindeer for Christmas time to put in your front yard. You take your chainsaw, you fire it up, you carve you out you this, this uh, reindeer, you set it up on Christmas, put lights on, it says, look what I created. <laughs> you didn't create anything. You realize? You didn't create anything. You may have made a copy of a reindeer, but you didn't create the wood, you didn't create the chainsaw, you didn't create the stain that you put on it. You didn't create the light. You didn't create anything. You just used what God had created that was, has been used in a form to which you have assembled, but God really created everything. Because if there was no wood, you could not carve wood. You follow me? That's the idea that somebody inspires somebody to make up something to write down. And so I was taught that through the inspiration, man was let go so that they could write down what they wanted to write down. And basically, when you come down to it, uh, I was taught, really, that whatever man lay, wrote down in the Scripture, God approved and rubber-stamped it and made it happen. Okay, wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. In fact, that's so wrong because the word inspired in the Scripture means breathed. <sighs> And in fact, some of our newer translations are accurately translating this passage in uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to say, all Scripture is breathed by God. Um, and by the way, according to Moses' book in the book of Exodus, during the wilderness and also er all the time he was in uh, trying to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, he is being directed by the Lord. And in fact, look here. And the Lord is overseeing his work. The Lord is not allowing him just to write down what he wants to write down or what he's heard. The Lord is making sure it's correct. Look at here. Here's just a part, part of an example. Exodus 19.1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, the third month, okay, got that? Third month, very day. They came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there the Lord, uh, and there Israel camped in, uh, in front of the mountain. 
And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say, it's pretty much instruction. This is what you're going to say, okay? The Lord says you're going to say this. Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my own possessions among all the people, for all the earth is mine. Who does all the earth belong to? God. Who's all the people belong to? God. Got it. Okay. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So what does Moses do? Does he go down and make up his own thing? No, look here. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set them before them and all set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him and all the people answered together and said, "All that the Lord has spoken we will do." And Moses brought that word, those words of the people back to the Lord and reported. He's under the direction of the Lord. In just a little bit Moses, going on, reading on in context, Moses is going to say, I want you to tell the people, and this is important, this is a biggie for me, because I don't think anything's changed when we come to worship the Lord and to listen to the Lord. He says, I want you to go down, I want you to tell the people to select their finest clothes, and I want you to tell them to wash them, and to cleanse themselves, and to bathe themselves, and to come to the foot of the mountain. And when they get to the foot of the mountain, they're to take off their shoes that they have cleaned because they are going to be on holy ground. And they come to the foot of the mountain, every one of them that came out of Egypt, they're 90 to 95 days down the road from leaving Egypt, and they're standing at the foot of the mountain in their best attire that they have, whatever it is. And the Lord out of the cloud speaks to them the Ten Commandments so they hear it in their ears. The Ten Commandments do not come to them the first time whenever Moses comes down the, the mountaintop with a set of stones that the Lord has carved out with His finger. No. The first time they hear the Ten Commandments is audibly in their ear at the foot of the mountain. We'll get to that when we get to Exodus. The Lord is in control. Then Moses goes back in the cloud. He comes back down with the plates. He's been up there for more than 40 days as the Lord is instructing Moses in the different things he's telling them to do and to write. He comes down with the plates. And lo and behold, Moses is so human that he loses his cool. And what does he do to the plates? Breaks them. Important point in how God operates. When God has given you something and does something for you and you break it, what did God make Moses do with, after those plates were broken? He did what? And did, what did he have to do to get the set of plates again? He had to carve them out himself. Now just apply that to your life. God's done something miraculous for you, which he has for everybody in this room, no matter how old you are. And you broke it. You know what God's going to allow, how God's going to fix it? You may keep saying, God, I broke it. I'm sorry. And God's going to say, yeah, you broke it, Moses. Carve you another set on your own. But make sure it's an exact duplicate. He will make you return back on your own. That's the reason why when God has blessed you so great and you start charging up on your credit cards because you, you think you got money rolling out your ears and, and then lo and behold... Your job comes to the end. You go, God, I need your help. Help me get out of debt. And you keep spending. And I'm telling you, God will allow you to dig out of that hole totally on your own and go debt free. And then when you're out of that hole, He starts blessing you again. Had you not gone wrong and broke it in the first place, God would have continued to bless you all the way through. I promise you. It's just the way it is. It's a principle. We'll see that more and more because it's a big principle all the way through the Scripture. 
90 days after leaving Egypt, Moses and the children of Israel are there at the foot of the Mount of Sinai. And Moses climbed the mountain and met with the Lord for extended periods. And the Lord directed his work. And within two years after arriving at that mountain, the book of Genesis has been pinned and put on stones for them to have to last to be with them, not paper, not vellum, it's on stones, so that they are able to have a permanent, un, um, un, uh, tarnishable by weather record that's going to end up going into the uh, Ark of the Covenant. A copy will be made and it will go into the Ark of the Covenant on vellum and all that, but it's first going to be carved, it's going to be permanent, and it's going to be breathed out of the mouth of the Lord. The Lord is making sure that the book of Genesis is correct because the rest of the Bible finds its foundation in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, 1. We're finding the scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. Every word that follows these words, every word in the rest of the scripture, Depends on this foundation. If you ignore this foundation of in the beginning God, you are going to come up with an incorrect conclusion in the rest of God's words about just about everything. It, if you do not have this as the foundation that in the beginning God, you got that in the beginning God, it wasn't you, it wasn't me, it wasn't some, some guy over in Russia, it wasn't some guy in China, it wasn't Buddha, it wasn't Muhammad, it wasn't Uxley, it wasn't Huss, it wasn't Darwin, it wasn't anybody else, it was God. And God alone, that God created us for His own being. He created this world for His own purpose. He created it for us. God did it for Himself. He created it and He did it and no one else has done it. And God existed before anything else. And He alone, He and He alone did it all. Now the Hebrew Bible actually starts with the word, uh, actually starts with the word Genesis. Now, in our English language, we have to write in the Genesis or in the beginning. Why did Tyndale, back when he was changed to translating into the first English translation, why did he use the word beginning? Because people even in that day didn't say, I want you to Genesis whipping the baking powder. You got it? I want you to begin whipping the bake the, the 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 powder the flour whipping the flour with the eggs and all that to make the bread they didn't use the word genesis but that's what it meant genesis in hebrew if you're speaking hebrew you're going to get it it's genesis genesis is the word that means beginning so the reality is the name of this book came from the first word in the hebrew text that said genesis or beginning and we say in the beginning so it fits in our english Elohim, which is God, created. First three words. Elo Genesis, Elohim, God created. Or beginning, God created. The word God is unique to our English language. When Tyndale is translating the first English translation of the Hebrew Scriptures... He is going to use the English, old English word of the Saxon period, God. The word God, G-O-D, is not going to be used in any of the other religions or the nations of the world as God until the advent of airplanes. With the advent of airplanes and flight between commercial area air, uh, areas whether you, if you fly into Russia and you are from Bolivia speaking that Mexican Spanish language when you fly into Moscow you have to as a Bolivian airline pilot speak to the tower in Moscow in what language English 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 you fly into any city in China, you have to speak in English. You, you fly into any place in uh, South America or in Ethiopia, be it any place, 
English is the language of the airline industry across the board. You speak. If you are from Singapore, when you fly in as a pilot into DFW in Dallas, Fort Worth, you speak to the tower in English. There's no translation needed. You speak in whatever broken English it is. You do not use the word nine. You use the word niner. niner. That's right. And other things like that. You have to know how to. With that came the advent of the use of the word God in our English word God. Now our English word God comes from the Hebrew word Elohim and its Greek partner, Theos. Well, now you can get some Korans, some Islamic Korans, that instead of using the word Allah, for our benefit, they have put the word God in them. Because that's our word. Because, in fact, you can get some Buddhist material that's translated into English, where they've translated their name for God into our word, God. This is very important. It's very important because God of the Old Testament, this Elohim God, which, by the way, is only found in our, New, in our Old Testament. It's not found in any other language, by the way, is unique to our Old Testament. It's unique to God the Creator. And the God of the Bible is not the God of the Koran. That's just one example. I'm just giving you one example. Look right here. I've given an example of two passages of Scripture from the Bible and from the Quran. Elohim Theos, Theos, that's our God. That's our Hebrew God, our Greek name for God. The God that we know. Our God never changes. James 1.17 Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. That's next week's lesson, by the way. Father of lights comes in next week. Don't miss it. At with whom there is no variation or shifting shadows. God never changes. What he says he will do, what he does, he says. He never changes. He doesn't change his mind. He always does what he says. But over in the Quran, with Allah, the God of Islam, says none of our revelations do we. By the way, that's interesting because the Quran is using plural pronouns about their one God, Allah. Okay, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten. None of them. We don't cause them to be forgotten. No, we don't. Ab we don't. Uh, we don't. But we substitute. You know, we're not going to change what we're doing, but we might substitute something. In other words, better or something similar. Well, it sounds like a change to me, doesn't it? If you're substituting something here or something better or something, okay, that's the knowest. Thou not that Allah hath power over all things. In other words, he can change his mind if he wants to. Look here. Our God, Elohim Theos, our God, loves all the people of the world. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but uh, have eternal life. God loves every one of us. He doesn't want any of us to perish. And by the way, we looked at that last week when we were talking about that. And that's actually in the context of verse 15, 16, and 17. But over in the Quran, Allah does not love all the people of the world. Uh, Surah 32 says, If we had so willed, we could certainly have brought every soul its true guidance. We could have had everybody saved. Allah says, if we wished. But the word from me will come true. Allah is saying, I will fill hell with jinns, that's Gentiles, and men all together. Doesn't that look like Allah hates some of the people of the world? But doesn't it look like we know that our God loves all the people of the world? Yes, some of them are doomed, but that doesn't dispense with the love of God for them. He loves them. Hey, folks, this is like mothers and fathers who love their kids, who love their child that's in prison. They hate what they did, but it does not erase their love for them. You understand? That's how God is. 
That kid has made his own choice. He's made bad choices. He's in prison. But it doesn't change the love that God has for them. It doesn't change our love that we should have for that prisoner either. But we do hate what he's done. In the beginning, God. Look here, created. No one else can take the credit for everything that exists. It is God's making and it's his alone. The word create is very interesting. Very interesting. From human positions, a man will cut down that tree. He'll carve that likeness of an animal. He'll back up and say, look what I made. Look what I created. You've heard this a while ago. But that's not what that means. This means, the word create, that out of nothing, God spoke everything into being by his almighty fiat. Dirt. Boom. Light. Boom. Water. Boom. It happens. All of the remaining scripture depends on us understanding about God created it. In the beginning, God created the heavens. I want you to notice here that God's first act was to create the heavens. It wasn't that he created the earth and the heavens. It's that he created the heavens and the earth. The earth did not create the heavens, nor did the imagination of any being that lived on earth create the heavens. The heavens were created by God, for God, by God, and by, for God, and by God alone. He created his visible dwelling before he created earth. Now later in the Bible, it tells us about that heaven. Let me give you a snapshot of it really quick. Some of you have been in a couple funerals lately, and I've done this, and it's, it's brought chills to you. I hope you get chills here. If you want to know where what I'm saying, just look to the footnotes, because every one of these is footnotes where you go find it. God's home. What does God's home look like? Okay, I've got a picture up here, so just hang on. Kind of looks like this. Kind of bad picture drawn. But just use this as an example. Here we go. God's home. Somewhere in all of creation, in what he's called the heavens, he created his dwelling place called the holy city. It's the heavenly city. It's called the city of peace. City of peace. City, Jeru, peace. Salam or shalom. Okay? In Hebrew, it's shalom. In English, it's Salem. Got it? Peace. It's Jeru, Salam. It's a place where God will wipe away all the tears and death will never occur again. And mourning and crying and pain does not exist. It's a city like a, a clear, clean, bright crystal jewel that just glows. It has a high wall around the complex with three gates on each side. Big old high wall. Three gates on each side. Here's just six because two sides are showing. Go around the other side. The, the gates have names to them. Judah, Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim, uh, Dan, Reuben. Who are those? Six of the, descend, tri, of the tribes. The heads of the tribes of the, <clears throat> of the nation of Israel. An angel. One angel stands at each one of those gates to guard the gate. The door to each gate is made of a single pearl. The holy city is built on a 12-layer foundation with each layer composed of a different precious stone. I'm not going to tell you about what the precious stones are there, but they're listed in your lesson. However, I will tell you this. Each layer has a name on it. Matthew, John, James, Thomas, Bartholomew, Thaddeus. We keep on going. Who are these names? The apostles. That's right. The, each, each level, each step is named after one of the apostles. That city is 1,500 miles wide. It's a cube. 1,500 miles deep and 1,500 miles tall. That means if you put this door, this gate about Houston, this gate is going to be somewhere in Kansas. This gate is going to be right at the border going into Canada because 1,500 miles from here going north gets you well into Canada. You follow me? This is a big city. It's as wide and, and it's long 
and as tall as it is on all sides, 1,500 miles. The walls are 215 feet thick. The walls are made of jasper, but the city on the inside is made of pure gold that is as clear as glass. A river containing the waters of life flow down from the throne of God straight out through the eastern gate of the city. And right down the middle, there is a golden avenue. On either side here, there's these trees. You'll see it through that little picture that is there. You see the picture underneath that city that I've kind of drawn there looking through the gate. Those trees bear fruit. By the way, there's fish in that river, and you'll, when you get to heaven, you're going to see them fishing out of that river. And they're going to be eating those leaves and that fruit. Fiery angels called seraphim were created also. They're going to surround the throne of God. They are by the tens of thousands, times ten thousands, times the tens of thousands. We cannot number them. They have six sets of wings, uh, one to uh, cover their face. One, to, one set to cover their feet and two others to fly with. And they surround the throne of God and they are continually saying things like, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. They do not sing. Angels do not sing. You never see them singing in the Bible. They only speak in chorus. They, they do not sing. The number of angels is huge. There's another set of angels called cherubim that were created on that first day. And their brilliance and their appearance is unlike anything else found in nature today, but it won't be unusual when we get there. These creatures seem to have multiple faces of, the, of multiple different animals, and they guard the throne of the Lord. There are four of these that are special that are out in front of the, of the throne, and they have the face of a, a lion, a bull, an eagle, and a man. There are four of them. And they are called the four living creatures. They, they have four sets of wings instead of six sets of wings of which, which they fly. They also have hands underneath these wings that look like human hands. And their feet are like calves' feet. And those feet are so beautiful, they're like polished bronze. The throne of God looks like it is made of lapis lazuli. By the way, that is a beautiful stone that is only found in the area of Afghanistan. So how Moses knew about that could only be by the hand of God at that point in time. And the throne has wheels. It's a rainbow around the throne. There's wheels within the middle of the wheels, lots of wheels, so the throne can go either direction, either way, without turning around. It can move without turning. Twenty-four thrones are there in front. You see that picture, or in front of the throne, in the future, and the future of the, of the creation, God will set 24 elders on those thrones. We'll talk about that later. They'll be on the seat. The, the front of that, and I wish I hadn't put the name up in the picture, but uh, Pat has done a great job with this picture. The front in front looks like a sea of crystal emerald. Just beautiful. The city contains the original, the original created in heaven, the original uh, tabernacle. The original Ark of the Covenant, the original table of showbread, the original golden lampstand, the curtains of the tabernacle with its boards, its sockets, the veil and the screen, the bronze altar, the courts and the tabernacles, the garments of the priest, the altar of incense, the anointing oil, and the actual incense. All of these are important because when Moses is up on the mountain, the Lord is going to open up heaven for, the, for Moses to see the real things in heaven and make sketches so he can go down and they can make replicas to be worshipped in here on earth. To worship here on earth in what is actually there for real in heaven. By the way, at the end in the book of Revelation, whenever the time for the everything to be consummated, the heavens open. And what do they see in the heavens? The Ark of the Covenant. Indiana Jones did not find the Ark of the Covenant. It's in heaven, okay? The book of remember, books of remembrance that writes down everything that you've ever done is, is, or created. The Lamb's Book of Life with every name that is going to, of every person that is ever going to be lived, born, conceived, whatever is written down. Every name is in that book. Those names will be blotted out for those who have rejected the Lord and have died. Their names will be blotted out of that book. The city is filled with rooms for those who love God. Those who will be called according to His purpose and accept Him. John 14, one of my favorite passages, 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come. It's Lord's promise. He's promised to me. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am you may be also. Folks, 
comfort with these words. When you take your last breath, someone's going to be there called the Lord Jesus Christ to take you by the hand and take you up to the throne of the Father. Come find comfort in those because that's what John is saying, uh, the Lord is saying uh, to his apostles in this book of John. Sheo in Hades is built during this creation on the first day as well as a place called Tartarus because the Lord already knows that some of his angels are going to fall away from him and going to sin against him and they're going to be so evil in what they're going to do that the Lord is not going to allow them to ever be in any of the following ages to come and they are locked in Tartarus until they are sent to the lake of fire during the great white throne judgment. The lake of fire is prepared on that first day too. And then lo and behold, the Lord says, in these heavens that I have built that have no sun, there's no stars, there's no nothing, let's hang out a big old blue ball of water that underneath that water has this hard surface of stuff this material underneath it and so in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and and there the sun's not there the earth's not there this ball is hung out in fact we're going to find out when we get down to verse 7 and we're not even really through with verse 1 yet in verse 7 we're going to find that God's going to shape this earth by altering it so that some of this land squeezes out and above and does all this type of stuff and the water has to move. But we've got to find out about the water. And then we've got to find out about the light because we're fixing to hit next week the light that is created before the sun is created and the moon and the other stars, the other suns. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> Don't you miss it. It is going to be good. It, some of you, 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 you NASA guys have already seen this and you've helped me with it. Help me understand it. And it is going to be spectacular. Don't miss it. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to study your word. And we love you in your name. Amen and amen.